Echoes of the Atlas is an expansion that introduces a second eldritch being, the Maven, to the Atlas. But she is not the only eldritch being still out there, and she won't be the last we encounter. The Maven has come to witness our struggle, specifically our fights with other beings in the Atlas. She pits us against others like toys, creating increasingly deadly scenarios with her chosen combination of combatants. She is the Andy to our Woody or Buzz Lightyear. But why has she come now? Who is the envoy that comes with her? And what will the consequences be of her final request, a battle between us and her? First, let's quickly go over the events that led up to the Maven and the Envoy's appearance in our Atlas. The Endgame lore is a continuously building story, and it began with Xana's father, Valdo Caesarius, who became the Shaper. Originally, Shaper was the big bad Endgame, a man who had gone mad with the powers bestowed upon him from the Atlas, who was creating and reshaping worlds without care. He had lost memory of his daughter Xana, who had been orphaned as a child and spent her whole life searching for him. The next expansion revealed that the Shaper, Xana's father, was in the Atlas to fight a malicious eldritch being called the Elder. We learned that the Elder had created the center of the Atlas, a pocket dimension Shaper dubbed the Dreamlands, the place from which all of its hunting grounds, the maps, were formed. The Elder is a being that served a greater force, called the Decay, and was trying to spread this rot while feasting on the memories and imaginations of all its victims, particularly children. The Shaper was manipulating the Atlas not out of madness, but as an attempt to distract the Elder from ever reaching Rayclast. By creating endless worlds, the Elder could be directed like a rat in a maze, but not stopped. The Elder had been feeding on Shaper's memories, which is why he didn't remember his daughter Xana. But the Shaper left information for Xana to find and utilize a tool he had created called the Cosmic Arcana. Since the Elder could not be killed outright and distracting him only bought time, Valdo, the Shaper, created something that could exile the Elder into the abstract of non-reality. During this expansion, we stopped the Elder. In the next expansion, it wasn't us who helped Xana seal the Elder in the Cosmic Arcana. It was the Conquerors, originally named the Elder Slayers, a team of five highly skilled warriors that assisted Xana in stopping the Elder. However, when they fought Elder, Cirrus had to push the Elder into the Cosmic Arcana to ensure he was trapped, and got trapped in it also. Cirrus seemed to be lost in that non-reality with the Elder, and the Elder Slayers began going mad with the power they found in the Atlas. Xana had warned them, and us, many times that the Atlas can drive people mad. She had seen it with her father, and she had seen it with other teams she had hired before the Elder Slayers. As Xana and the Elder Slayers tried to find Cirrus after his sacrifice, they dropped out of the team one by one, choosing to pursue their own desires instead. Xana, fearing they may become threats to Oriath and Rayclast, sealed them in the Atlas. Cirrus returned and began tormenting them all. Cirrus was changed by whatever he experienced in the Cosmic Arcana. He could not feel anything but his rage at being abandoned. With the Elder Slayers now mad conquerors and Cirrus an empowered threat, possibly having absorbed the Elder's powers, we find them all and attempt to defeat them. Cirrus manages to break out of the Atlas and attack Oria destroying it to spite Xana and everyone else who left him. With both Oriath and Cirrus gone, we end up on the Karui Shores. But it isn't just Cirrus who has gone, it is also the Elder, an eldritch being, supposedly eternal, unable to be destroyed, has disappeared. And while we may rejoice in his disappearance, the stars, full of unknown beings of equal power, turn their gaze upon the place where an unending being has vanished. This event, the destruction of the Elder, is known amongst the vast abyss of the cosmos as the Silence. And this silence, this lack of the Eternal Elder, is of great intrigue to those beings. What force could cause such an impossible event? And here is where Echoes of the Atlas begins. 
An unknown number of eternal entities has felt the deafening silence coming from where the Elder once feasted and spread its decay. The Atlas, once the Elder's domain, is now an intriguing anomaly, a beacon to those eldritch beings. In one of our maps, the Envoy appears, a messenger from a place of great darkness and great distance, in a form most pleasing to those who must listen. Those great and unreachable have heard the silence echoing from that which once hunted here, and they have turned their gaze to this place. Rejoice, nomad, for she approaches, and she seeks to witness your struggle. The maven appears at the boss of that map, giving it strength and vitality boons to make our fight harder. If we defeat the boss, we receive the Maven's Beacon, an orb we can place in our atlas that will allow the Maven to find us in a map, mess with the boss, and add it to her collection. Once we've gathered a certain number of bosses, we must fight all of them at once in her arena, called the Maven's Crucible. Crucible meaning a place of great trial and heat that mixes together different substances to create something new. These fights become harder and harder, with more and tougher bosses, and eventually, the Maven wants to fight us herself. A quick note, the Elder's arena is called the absence of value and meaning, while the Maven's is the absence of mercy and empathy. To take a step back, the Envoy and Maven's appearance in our maps is interesting, because Xana tells us that there are two sources of entities within the Atlas and I'm certain no one has entered from this side. Somehow, they have entered from the other side, which Xana theorizes is some unknown parallel realm. It seems this door is newly opened, as the Envoy tells us that after the silence of the Elder's disappearance, there was a first lurching movement of boundaries drawn long before the dawn. The Maven has arrived as the first claimant on this source of the silence. She is not the Elder, she does not serve the Decay, but she is Eldritch. She serves only her own amusement, passing eternity with an endless string of meaningless struggles. She is not the Elder, but you are right to fear her. So the Maven is an Eldritch being like the Elder, but doesn't serve the Decay. She is powerful, but she is also apparently a toddler, a nymph. She is a child seeking entertainment drawn in by the shiniest beacon of interest in the cosmos, this great silence. The Envoy gives us the bits and pieces of the story of the Maven, the Envoy, and others as we wander through the maps. Most of the lines are verbose and convoluted, just like me. But I will try to put together the pieces of this looming Eldritch puzzle. The Maven was created by her progenitor, who we will discuss later. I believe the envoy was there to witness her birth, when he says, The eternal stillness was replaced by a billowing storm of movement, eyes and teeth reflecting the smallest of lights like furious and starving constellations. As she grew, they, possibly her parents, sought novelties from far and wide at her insistence, but these toys were never satisfying her curiosity, her lust for conflict and contest. The Maven grew bored of the realm she was given, and seeks new conflict. That's why she has traveled to the Atlas, and why she demands that we fight. As the Maven grew, she began to learn. There was a lesson hidden in everything that moved, and everything that did not. What separated the two? A life, she determined, was the difference. But she moved, and would never not. Was she alive? Now, the Maven seeks to understand the difference between mortal life and her own eternal existence. I believe that when she tells us she did not know we were like her after we defeat her in battle, that she realizes we have a power that rivals her own. She had never felt any challenge to her own safety and ability before. I don't think we can assume this means we're eldritch or a god or eternal. Maybe we're on the way to godhood but it certainly means we have power. A power that makes us closer to her equal than other forms of life she's played with. Kirak foreshadows her realization when he says, maybe one day she will recognize you as a peer, and then perhaps we can ask her to give Baron back to us. 
Kirak believes that the Maven is the cause of Baron's and the others' continuous resurrection in the Atlas. Just like map bosses, she is using them as a toy to fight us for her amusement. But before the Maven arrived in the Atlas, the envoy implies she was trapped. She tried to flee, to leave the island prison of her making, but the prison walls towered so far above, lined with silent sentries armed with sharp spears that could pierce her shadow. What kind of prison is this? And of her own making? Perhaps it's more of a crib, a protection put around her as she grew by her progenitor. So of her making would mean of her birth, rather than of her creation or design. When the Elder disappeared and the Great Silence began, the walls still towered but now folded and frayed to her touch. She fled and in doing so dragged countless in her wake. He followed her, though he did not want to. He saw a moment when he could escape, but he did not. His form was stuck with her, even if his mind wasn't. The envoy later tells us that they are of one flesh, but two minds, two bodies. We are kin, both born of the tangled anarchy of the Void, but we share not the same creator. She is my ward, and she is my prison. I am her protector, and I am her servant. The envoy is not her protector by will. He is forced by her parents or creators to watch her. But even then, they're not created by the same entity. Who created the envoy? So now, let's dive into the envoy's story, or what we can put together from it. The actual origins of the envoy were the most difficult parts of the story to try to decipher. Honestly, this is mostly theory, so if you have any different ideas or evidence, please comment below and let me know. Oriath.net is a great resource for in-game dialogue and was super helpful with gathering the envoy's lines from maps. I believe the envoy is from another world, and was possibly a leader there. He says that he came upon a bastion of flesh that towered above, smothering the stars, and those who followed in my footsteps did not halt. I was crushed and swallowed whole, urged unerringly by those I led. It sounds like the envoy had followers, but now he is a servant to at least the Maven's progenitor, and possibly another figure called the Light Keeper, who I'll discuss more later. He finishes this part with, I was welcomed into his embrace. And the envoy only uses he, him, or his when talking about this Light Keeper. I believe the envoy led people, encountered this Light Keeper, and was taken as the Light Keeper's servant as his own people were vanquished. Whatever the envoy did, he was punished for it by those he now serves, and he refers to this punishment multiple times. I think they made him eternal, as he says this was their gift to me, their eternal servant, to walk among the countless silent screaming dead and witness. The punishment of the envoy for his past actions was to serve and protect the maven. I was led into the darkness and given a torch, burning with fury, to guide my path to her. I was consumed by the journey and thrust into her care as a hollow shell, to protect and limit and never leave her. The word torch makes me think the Light Keeper had some involvement in this punishment, and the envoy being consumed and turned into a hollow shell makes me think he took on some new form. The envoy is attached to the Maven taking care of her eternally and watching as she grew. For a long time, nothing happened. Those I serve cast their eyes upon an endless, unchanging horizon and have never had cause to look away. Without change, time is invisible, meaningless, and insignificant to one with no beginning and no end. He watched the Maven and her chosen entertainment, pitting beings against one another for amusement until the silence began. The eyes that dwell among the stars roll and turn and focus on this place. It is the source of the silence, the beginning of the beginning, the point where that which roamed and fed ceaselessly was undone. Since the envoy is attached to the maven when she escaped in pursuit of this beginning, the source of the silence, he was brought with her. 
On his arrival to the Atlas, he has taken on a new form. Here, he kind of looks like a harbinger and a man combined. Celestial essence can be seen through a crack in his skull. He claims he has taken on the image of those who needed to hear its message, but also that he was originally woven from long dead stars in its image. Its here is possibly the progenitor, possibly the light keeper. The envoy laments, I try to remember its shape and cannot. Try to fall into my past and cannot. I am anchored by you, nomad, buried and drowned by your presence. Perhaps the confusion in the envoy's story is because of our influence, which has altered his shape, so possibly also his memories. He's stuck in this new form he has taken as the Maven's messenger to us, an image to reflect our own and to guide us. A quick summary before we dive into even more confusing elements of this story. The envoy is the Maven's ward, a caretaker enslaved by her parents or creator to make sure the Maven is unharmed. They come from an unknown realm, the Void, the Stars, where the Maven was growing, being entertained by conflict and conquest. The Elder's disappearance weakened the barrier between their realm and the Atlas. Intrigued, the Maven came to the Atlas to seek out new entertainment, having grown bored, and the envoy was dragged along. He must convince us to entertain her, while also protecting her from any harm, lest her progenitor or any other eldritch beings be alerted to her pain and displeasure and come punish the envoy. And us. The envoy, in this limbo between entertaining and protecting the Maven, allows us to fight her when she commands it. But once we've done enough damage, he intervenes. He warns us that were we to continue, it would surely call for its progenitor, and we would drag all into its gaping maw. More alarmingly, he tells us to savor our remaining time, prepare for its arrival, I urge you. The Maven's progenitor, with its gaping maw, is now coming towards the Atlas. It slashes through the stars and surges towards the silence now. It is moving with purpose and direction and intent, and it fills me with awe and fear and desire. The progenitor created the Maven to test the limits of limitless power, to bear the burden of the creator and wade through time's mire, a meaningless obstacle in the face of eternity. The weakening of the barrier between the Atlas and this other realm has opened a door for it. Where the Bastion once stood unmoving and unerringly eternal, now the flesh curls and relinquishes its grip on the stone. It hurls unanchored through a vast sea of darkness. It will arrive, though I know not when or how. The Light Keeper that the Envoy mentioned earlier is connected to this progenitor. We know that the Envoy must take care of the Maven, so it's likely the Envoy has encountered this progenitor. But the Envoy seems to serve the Light Keeper. He says that duty is a blessing. We act without hesitation or thought to the murmurs of the Light Keeper. Though the path is illuminated by him, we do not see it and do not need to see it. To look ahead is to fall to dust in the light. Her progenitor is an ambitious creator, while the Light Keeper is a wary observer of the Maven and her potential. The imagery of becoming dust in the light is also mentioned when the envoy describes being with the Maven. I tried to count the ones who followed her past the barrier, but none did, or all who did fell to dust in the light. This was the duty of one alone. The Light Keeper took the envoy to the Maven, but I don't think he's excited about the silence, like the Maven and her progenitor are. As all of the Eldritch entities have their attention drawn to the source of the silence, our Atlas, the Light Keeper can only stand and cast its glow and watch them all become entangled by the leash of desire. So, here's my theory about the Light Keeper. The Light Keeper and the Progenitor both care for the Maven. The Envoy was given the task, or punishment, of protecting and limiting the Maven, 
not only to help the Maven, but also to stop her if needed. The Lightkeeper and the Maven's progenitor are like opposite forces that respect each other. I believe that the progenitor is order and ambition, and the Lightkeeper is time and entropy in the Envoy's lines. Order and ambition urge progress, and time and entropy stay progress's hand. Her progenitor tests limits, and the Lightkeeper, like time, limits them. The progenitor is eager to see the Atlas, as the Maven was. The envoy tells us that the progenitor's arrival is imminent and to be feared. So the progenitor is a creator, something desirous, moving with purpose and direction and intent. The Lightkeeper can only stand and cast its glow and watch them all become entangled. He tries to stay progress's hand. I believe that these two, together, are those the Envoy serves. Stepping back from the Void and the Unknown, these events have had an effect on Kirak and Xana. Xana, frankly, is pissed at us. She spent her entire life following the footsteps of her father, seeing the horrors of the Atlas and watching everyone and everything she loved destroyed by the Elder. When we get the beacon from the Maven, Xana notes that there's an energy within it that fills me with dread. It's reminiscent of the Elder, but different, less malignant. When we use the beacon on our Atlas, she is beside herself. How do you know this isn't some kind of scrying orb designed to allow that entity to peer into our realm, or even pass into it uncontested? You're following in the footsteps of my father and Venarius when they released the Elder. And she's not wrong. That's exactly what the beacon is for, so the Maven can find us anywhere in the Atlas. The Atlas is massive. That's why we have to work diligently to find and defeat the Conquerors, wandering through many different maps to pinpoint their locations. Xana is also correct that we don't have the tools we need to seal away another creature like the Elder, or even to begin constructing anything like the Cosmic Arcana that her father the Shaper had created. If the Maven had ill intent, we would unquestionably be guilty of helping her. Now that her progenitor is coming after her, have we lit a beacon for it to find us? If the Elder's disappearance weakened the barrier to the Atlas, did we just break down the door? Xana has always questioned our sanity, but now she questions our judgment and our intentions. Now, before I conclude the video, here are some random bits I couldn't quite figure out. One is the Envoy's line about the Dreamer, the only mention of this name. The Dreamer's promise was at once fulfilled, though we did not know it. But an eternity will pass before we feel his fire. The only person I can think of is the Shaper as the Dreamer. Valdo entered and left the Dreamlands by falling asleep at the map device he was working on for Venarius that eventually led to the Elder's release from its imprisonment. He also promises that he, and he alone, will end the Elder. But how could Eldritch beings hear his promise? And what would the Envoy mean by his fire? Another mysterious line addresses us directly. You think you are exploring the boundaries of existence. You are an insect charting cracks of the ancient stone on which you stand, blind to the dead stone forest that encircles. It howls, nomad. It weeps and howls and cries to be witnessed. Maps have been called stones before, but what gets me is the dead stone forest surrounding. Could this instead refer to the planet, surrounded by other planets that have been wiped of life? The Envoy tells us that the Maven wants to witness us, and that Eldritch beings turn their gaze here. Are the stones Eldritch beings waking up? He says the veil, now pulled away, reveals the rust of eons. The emptiness drew them in, patina sloughing in crushing waves all greedy and desperate and newly alive. The Eldritch are waking up, 
breaking out of the monotony of eternity and fixating on the atlas with desire. And if we are on an ancient stone, is it also dead? Or is it going to die with all this attention drawn to it? I find this to be the most ominous of the Envoy's lines. So, what's coming next? We know for certain the Maven's progenitor is coming for the Atlas. It will likely be less naive and less amicable than the Maven, as the Envoy himself seems afraid of it. Xana is very upset with us, and as many have speculated, this might be the beginning of Xana turning on us, or at the very least abandoning us for our hasty and harmful decisions. Interestingly, Kirak mentions that the wound Cirrus inflicts on him in our battle with Cirrus is not healing, that it has a latent disintegration eating away at me about the same speed as the skin naturally grows back. Could this be related to the Elder and his decay? Does this prove the Elder is not gone, but simply part of Cirrus? Xana does say about Cirrus that whatever happened to him in the wake of the Elder's sealing stole the very essence of his being. Perhaps the Elder's silence is not his defeat, but his evolution. The Envoy has a line that mentions our death. I watched the nomads passing with great admiration. Its life was brief and without consequences, and its struggle fueled the growth and maturation of the wizened and eternal. He seems happy that we help the maven, and maybe other eldritch beings grow and mature, but he says our life is brief. How brief? For an eternal being, maybe that doesn't mean we'll die soon, but just brief in relation to their reality. But if the progenitor is coming for us, maybe our death will be sooner than we think. Oh, you make me want to talk back. Talk back to you. Say you say it like that. If I hate you, then find someone new. But you know I never will, no So I choke you